brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point, which is based on a blog of the same name. Because like the iZombie zombies, we retained our essence and the transfer to podcast format even as we crave more TV. Like zombies crave brains? Maybe? My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like. For Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and the unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, our exclamation point, is ready for our summer season and hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the blog or the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and via Google Play to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including, but not limited to, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, The Vampire Diaries, Orange is the New Black, The Good Place, Grace and Frankie, Fuller House, Game of Thrones, Broad Church, and Stranger Things. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for Doctor Who, American Horror Story, A Series of Unfortunate Events, The X-Files, Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., New Girl, The Originals, Supernatural, Gotham, Once Upon a Time, 13 Reasons Why, The Marvel's Defenders panel will talk season two of Jessica Jones, and the DCTU will revisit all four shows in the CW's Arrowverse. We'll be launching new panels covering Sense8, The Crown, Schitt's Creek, Will and Grace, Westworld, and Arrested Development. We'll be launching a new feature called Versus, where we'll be comparing shows in a spicy debate. And because we look back at shows now past, we'll be looking back at one of our most popularly requested panels of all time, which is Friends, and I promise it is coming. By the way, did you know that CPU also from time to time goes live? We've been live from the bunker, comedy outlet Mondays at Dog Story Theater and Grand Rapids Comic Con, and we're planning more live appearances and other cool stuff. So make sure you like or follow us at our Facebook page, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or subscribe to the blog, our YouTube channel, our iTunes channel, our Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Play. In the meantime, if you don't hear a show in this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews and we always seek new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of those outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, review. We like feedback. Just don't go all Romero on us, okay? We promise we'll feed your brains. Get it? Today, we are around the water cooler and taking a first look at the first three seasons of a CW horror crime procedural comedy drama addition to the annals of zombie fiction, namely iZombie. We're doing this as part of a two-part miniseries in which CPU catches up on this quirky show. In this episode, part one of the miniseries, we are discussing season one, which aired from March 14, 2015 to June 9, 2015, with a total of 13 episodes, season two, which aired from October 6, 2015 to April 12, 2016, with a total of 19 episodes, and Season 3, which aired from April 4, 2017 to June 27, 2017, with a total of 13 episodes. We'll discuss Season 4 in our subsequent episode in this miniseries. iZombie is an American television series developed by Rob Thomas and Diane Ruggiero Wright for The CW. It is a loose adaptation of the comic book series of the same name created by Chris Roberson and Michael Allred and published by DC Comics under their Vertigo imprint. Seattle medical resident Olivia Liv Moore, played by Rose McIver, is turned into a zombie while attending a boat party. She abandons her career and breaks up with her fiancé, Major, played by Robert Buckley, much to the disappointment and puzzlement of her family. She discovers that if she does not periodically satisfy her new appetite for brains, she starts turning into a stereotypical zombie, stupid and homicidal. Instead of feeding by killing innocent people, Liv decides to take a job at the King County Morgue and eat the brains of the corpses she autopsies. Her secret is guessed by her boss, Dr. Ravi Chakrabadi, played by Raul Coley. Ravi soon becomes Liv's friend and confidant, and as a scientist, he is intrigued by her condition. Liv finds out that whenever she eats a dead person's brain, she temporarily inherits some of their personality traits and skills, and she experiences flashbacks of that person's life. 
Those visions are generally triggered by sights, events, or objects, or sounds in repeated sentences. In the case of murder victims, the flashbacks offer clues about the killer. Liv decides to use this new ability to help police detective Clive Babineau, played by Malcolm Goodwin, to solve crimes. Though she initially passes herself off as a psychic, Clive eventually learns the truth about her and zombies. Meanwhile, Ravi works to develop a cure for Liv's affliction in the hope that one day she'll be able to resume her former life. Around the water cooler today are three of our frequent panelists and your very involved moderator, all of whom are excited to crack open some skulls and devour some of this decidedly clever, one might say brainy, comedy drama. As always, it should be noted that all of our panelists have watched all episodes of all available seasons of I, Zombie to date and may discuss sensitive plot points. So for those of you who have not watched any I, Zombie and plan to do so at some point, listen at your own risk as there may be major spoilers. At this time, I would like to introduce our panel to those of you who are new to CPU. This is how this works. I'm going to ask each panelist to identify themselves by their first name, just their first name, not your life story. That's just how we do it. And then tell us how you came to watch iZombie. What made you start watching? How'd you find out about it? What kept you watching? And then you get to rate your interest in iZombie based upon the CPU standard character question, which changes with each show we do. Panelists, are you ready? Yes. 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 Awesome. So, after you, of course, introduce yourself, how would you rate your interest in iZombie? And you can answer this generally, but we are covering seasons one through three today, so if you'd like that perspective, you can use that as well. Do you love iZombie? If you had your choice, you would be a zombie. Or maybe you wouldn't. But you would do everything you could to make the best of your zombification, should you be scratched, including finding new and interesting ways to spice up and gourmet prep your brains. You also believe watching this show, and in turn Liv's consumption of and visions from different brains, gives you meaning in your life, like Olivia or Liv Moore. Are you truly fascinated by every single episode, vision, discovery, and crime that crosses through your personal morgue of zombie obsession? You think this show is a more than decent... You're British, so this is a conservative opinion, addition to the annals of zombie fiction, like Ravi Chakrabarty. To be honest, the zombie antics, particularly brain visions, and on-again, off-again romances sort of freak you out, but you're willing to roll with it. In fact, though you may have been reluctant to understand the appeal at first with each passing week or episode, you find yourself more and more wholeheartedly engaged and the show more enjoyable, like Major Lily White. Do you like the procedural or case of the week element? You like to solve the mysteries, even if you don't care much for the zombie spin on the story? Or germs, like Detective Clive Babineau? Do you think the show is just cashing in on the popularity of zombie fiction, like other properties such as The Walking Dead, but you have no problem taking part in the cashing in, and you sort of enjoy watching it for the musical interludes provided by the Blaine character, like Blaine De Beers McDonough, or you can't handle the show and we're ready to run at the mere mention and or sight of zombies, or you're forced to watch it by someone else in your household who's obsessed with zombies and you just make do depending on the week, like Peyton Charles. Who would like to start? I'm Jen S. Hi, Jen S. And I, <laughs> you want me to say how I came to watch it first? Though? Yes, I do. Okay. So I think I was thinking about, I don't not quite sure how I came upon the show. I think it was on Hulu. I think we had Hulu still at that time because this was four years ago, right? It started. Yep. Yeah, I think it must. I must have just seen it on Hulu from because I used to watch all the time Hulu stuff and just saw it and was intrigued by it and watched the first episode and was like, okay, this is way different than any other zombie show I've seen. So I was hooked from the first episode. Um, for pretty, yeah, pretty much. It was pretty quick. Okay. And I would say, oh, I only supposed to pick one, aren't I? I mean, it has to stop anybody <laughs> else in this room. Well, I think I'm. I I definitely love iZombie. So I'm definitely live. I would say. Okay. But I'm also. I think I'm part Ravi. I'm not truly fascinated by every single episode. I mean, there was like a lull. In the third season, I think it was, because I, I rewatched the first two seasons and I was hooked. So I know I know there was a point in time where I got a little bit back, not watching it as quick as I used to. And I think that was during the season 30, because season 4 picked back up. So so it's not every, so maybe half, Robbie. I think that's it then. Okay. Like one and a half. 
Does that count? Live and half Robbie? Sure. That's the best I've done ever. <laughs> Well, congratulations, <laughs> and welcome back, Jen S. Listeners who listen to the CPU have heard Jen S. on our Vampire Diaries and Originals, Supernatural, if it's on the CW, and if it's got Supernatural stuff, you probably heard Jen, but she's also on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and if there's anything else I'm missing, feel free to chime in. <laughs> welcome back. Thank you. I'm Jen K., and not to be confused with the other Jen that's on this podcast panel, I got started watching iZombie from Netflix when they put the first season on there. And I kind of saw previews for the show beforehand, but I didn't have TV, so I didn't watch it. But then I found it on Netflix. I watched the first episode, and lo and behold, throughout the entire day, I managed to finish the first season in one sitting. Wow. Yeah. Back in the days when I was hardcore binging. Anyway, so... I did that, and likely it was right around the time when season two started, and it was still on Hulu, so I just kind of piggybacked off of that, watching that show. And then kind of what Jen S. said, during season three, there was a little bit of a lull. I skipped some of the episodes, but later when it was added back onto Netflix, I did watch those. And then for the ratings, I would say I would be a Robbie, just because for some, some of the episodes are obviously better than others. And again, with the lull that was in season three, that did drug the series along a little bit. But otherwise, like, I still like it. They picked right back up when they needed to, and still one of my favorite shows. I tell people if they need to find a show, then they should watch iZombie. All right. Welcome back, Jen K. Jen K is on the Originals podcast with Jen S. She's also on our 13 Reasons Why panel. Help me out, Jen K. You're on Series of Unfortunate Events. I think that might be it. <laughs> That's true, because you did bail on the one. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, up on Gallivant. Oh, yeah, and Gallivant. That's right. We looked back at that one. Yep. Well, welcome back, Jen K. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Hi, I am not a Jen. So. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness. goodness. Thank goodness. So I started, okay, so iZombie. I had first heard about iZombie because I love or loved, past tense, Once Upon a Time. And Rose McIver, who plays Liv, was Tinkerbell in season three of Once Upon a Time. True. Absolutely loved her. And then I found out she was leaving that show. And I'm like, but why? That's a great show, and she's doing a great job, and it's because she got the lead in this new show called I Zombie. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll have to check that out. And then lo and behold, I found out kind of her main, I don't I really don't really want to say the villain, maybe the main antagonist, was played by David Anders, who I loved when he was Julian Sark on Alias, because Alias was like my big show in the early 2000s. So I had two people that I really liked in this new show. Awesome. I will watch it at some point. So, but I actually didn't start watching it until Netflix had released either season one or season two in its entirety onto this, onto their platform. So that's when I started watching it and I have been in love with it ever since. Based on that, Mm -hmm. I would probably, so fun fact, I hate dead things. So dead dead bodies. That's a fun fact. So dead bodies really freak me out. So, oh. <laughs> as much as I, I, I am a Ravi, I, I, Ravi's probably my favorite character, so I'm definitely a Ravi. I love every single episode, except for that lull in season three, because I agree there was a big one. I'll be Ravi, maybe with a hint of Liv, but not much. Well, well <laughs> she's almost the opposite of me. I almost am. <laughs> and she looks real confident. But I love the Ravi. I love the I love Ravi. Ravi. The He's, actor and character Ravi. Oh my gosh. He is my, he is my yes. favorite. I think the sh- the show would sink if he wasn't in it. Mm-hmm. I don't think it would. Hold on, I okay. gotta talk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I would jump oh, right in. I know. Hold that thought. Welcome back to Kristen. Kristen is, of course, our most frequent panelist. Yay. If you listen to nerdy show panels like I Zombie, you've probably heard Kristen's voice. Most of the time. Most of the time. I'm sorry. I'm on a lot of panels. I watch a lot of nerdy TV. She does. But that's why she's a woman after my own heart. Aww. Aww. Hearts, hearts, hearts. So, I, of course, am Kylie. I've mentioned that. And I started watching iZombie, well, 
if you know me or you talk to me about this relative TV addiction I have or you follow the blog or you follow the podcast, you know that I look to see what's coming out in the fall to spring TV season, sometimes the summer. And in 2014, I learned that iZombie was going to be a property that CW was going to air, but not until spring. It didn't come with a trailer. It didn't come with a lot of description, but it was based on a DC comic, so that was probably an automatic for me. And I'm not actually a big fan of zombie fiction. Of all the supernatural monsters, I could rate zombies at the very lowest. They're dumb, and normally they just eat things and go, and then people shoot them in the head. That's basically what happens. <laughs> so I didn't know how I would feel about this other than I had read the description, which kind of reminded me of a cross between Shaun of the Dead and Bones because her visions would allow her to solve the different murders of the week. There was dark comedy afoot, so I figured this has potential. I'll give it a try. I didn't watch it at all because obviously I'm a TV podcaster and I watch it on a TV. So I didn't watch it for the first time until this year and I caught it on Netflix. I also struggled with it a little bit at first just because it is a procedural television show and those are the ones that kind of, they have to get me on something, but it got me pretty quick. I didn't spend a lot of time getting used to it. But it didn't hook me from episode one. It probably hooked me from episode four or something. <laughs> so just because it, it does have that crime of the week format and relies on that pretty heavily, at least for the first couple of seasons. That being said, after all of that explanation, I have now watched iZombie through, of course, to season four, which, of course, we'll talk about in our next episode, and have thought it's got better almost every season except for the heretofore mentioned lull in season three, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. So if I was going to rate myself on this character question, I actually would probably put myself as a major, at least to start, because I was sort of, I, I, I was not freaked out, but I was at least trying to roll with it and see where it would take me. However, I think I've now become, at least as of the end of season three, a Ravi. I agree that Ravi is also my favorite character. How can he not be anybody's favorite character? We'll answer right. that question. <laughs> but I love iZombie. I can't wait to talk about it. And today we're talking about seasons one through three. So this is like one of our big packed catch-up episodes. We're going to talk through each of the seasons. But before we do, because we're taking a first look at iZombie, we now have to do the star rating scale, which does not change with each show we do. This is a standard star rating or the star business, as frequent panelist Hillary calls it. And this is how this works. Basically, you're going to give me a sort of a snapshot star rating about how well or how lovely you think iZombie is or not lovely, depending upon where you fall. How would you rate it? Is it five stars? You have to watch everything. Holy smokes. It's the greatest zombie TV show you've ever seen in your whole damn life. You just cannot believe how awesome iZombie is. Five stars. Is it four stars? It certainly seems intriguing. You're going to keep watching, but you see possible pitfalls in the premise. Is it three stars? You'll, you'll give it a little bit more try or a few more tries. There are things you like, things you don't. You want to see which things are allowed to flourish. Did you only watch part of iZombie, maybe part of the first season, or maybe you gave up after a time? Chances are you're mainly bored. There's some intrigue or fascination that could hold it together, no matter how unlikely, but you can't convince yourself to keep watching as of this time. Or is it one star? Pass on this one, guys. It's a snoozer. It's not funny. It's not interesting. It's not your cup of tea. Zombies are stupid. There's too many options to waste time on this show. One star. Who would like to give their star rating first? I will give it a solid four. A solid four. A solid four. I I like that even though it, it is a procedural, you know, the, the crime of the week with along with an overarching storyline, every brain that Liv eats has been different. And so they really haven't repeated a storyline yet, which I really thought they would have by this point as to season three. So I think they're doing a really good job at keeping it fresh, for lack of a better term. And it, it's definitely kept my attention the whole way through. It's very solid. So I will give it a, I'll give it a solid four. I also agree with that. I give it a four. Everything is 
been pretty fresh, I think. I enjoy the way she eats brains the most. <laughs> Every time it's different. It is! It is! <laughs> it's, 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 it's how is she going to eat it? How is she going to eat the brain this time? You know, it's always different. It's always different. Right? It's so just fascinating. Just it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Four stars? Four stars. Okay. At first, I would like to point out how often they keep using the word fresh during the show, like fresh brains. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty much like everything I think of whenever they say fresh is like, oh, fresh brains, or making a joke for a zombie. But for me, I would give it a 4.5, actually, because compared to other zombie shows, there really isn't one like it. Not only with like the crime of the week, but with the idea of having the flashbacks or like the other memories slash traits of the person whose brain that the zombie eats that's definitely very different because for me i for zombie stuff normally i like it where it doesn't quite fit in what you're used to so like when zombie land came out i that was one of my favorite things because it was so different and you had zombies that like they weren't super slow but they ran like super fast and for i zombie like it's a good addition i think to the zombie culture that there is without it being too much distinct from being a zombie and if i were to rate it i'm gonna do what I normally annoys me and do a fraction that's not a 0.5. <laughs> I'm going to give it four and a quarter stars. If I were to rate this right after the first episode, it would definitely be a four star. Because after the first episode, I could see potential pitfalls. I could believe that there could be some repetition because of the procedural element. I was not feeling necessarily the ensemble right away, but it did certainly seem intriguing. I was definitely intrigued. However, as the seasons progressed, and by the end of season three, I definitely would land at a four and a half stars myself. I've really grown kind of to really like the show. I think the ensemble has coalesced very, very well. A lot of my concerns have been allayed. I think they've avoided the pitfalls pretty well, except for in season three. So we will talk about that, but I would land at four and a quarter, which is probably what the average is going to be anyway, so it just works out. <laughs> Less math. Good. Okay. So this is how this is going to work. We're going to talk about each season in turn in one of our, again, mass catch-up episodes. And it's going to be a little weird just because it was weird for the show in terms of their release history. Season two is longer than either of the seasons okay. surrounding it and went from fall to spring as opposed to just spring. So we'll kind of account for that. That means there was way more brains of the week. And by the way, we're calling them brains of the week because it wasn't really a crime of the week. It was, it was a brain of the week. week. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk first about season one. We get introduced to this whole iZombie universe in a variety of new and fun ways. I'll start with kind of the, the premise. You know, Liv, she's a new zombie. She becomes the medical examiner. She's sneaking portions of the brains at first, although Ravi eventually encourages it when he figures it out himself. She sees visions of the victim's last memories, often revealing a violent crime, or she learns of the violent crime and then sees the visions. And then she teams up with Clive Babineau, a detective, to solve murders as a consulting psychic. And then things kind of build from there. What did you think of season one? What did you like? What didn't you like? I went into season one not knowing that it was based on a comic book. Okay. So I, I thought that the way that they did the opening titles and also the, the start of every new scene where it was done in that comic book style was actually just a really cool artistic choice. I had no idea that it was a comic. So good for them. I yeah, like the way they incorporated their own little heritage into the show. I didn't know it was comic either until about halfway through I found out. I don't even remember how I found out. It must have been somewhere on the internet. Maybe I read about it or something. But yeah, I, I thought it was for it because cool. I, I was wondering why it was called iZombie. I'm like, it's, are they just playing on the like the iPhone, like the uh -huh. i, the i thing that like the big thing? And then when I looked at it. And that's, oh no, it's based on a comic book. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Well, and it's also based on one of the Vertigo comics. So DC basically has kind of a, an alternate, alternative publication arm, if you will, where instead of just strict superheroes, they have kind of these different subjects in comics and graphic novels. That's what Vertigo is. So that's what Zombie, I Zombie got printed mm -hmm. on. And I actually think there are some graphic novels, too, as opposed to strict comic books with heart bound and everything. So, But I have not personally read it. So what did you think of the season? Tell me what you thought of the show, the premise, the characters. I liked it because it was so different. 
I watched The Walking Dead. Fear the, well, that time it wasn't on Fear of the Dead, Walking Dead, but Walking Dead is so different. Any of the zombie movies you've seen, it's just really, really different. And I think that's what I liked about it. Mm -hmm. That, and it's, you know, got a little bit, you know, it's funny, and it's got a little bit of romance going on in it, and action, of course, and drama, drama, drama. But So I think that's why I was interested in it and kept watching, and they never let me down until season three. <laughs> but my only question, I was thinking about this today, because I did just finish the entire season two in like three days. If Robbie is so smart, <laughs> you, you know what I'm going to say. Go ahead. If he's so smart and brilliant, which I think that he is, mm -hmm. I'm not questioning that. <laughs> what the hell is he doing in a morgue? Why is he working yeah. in a morgue? And it never says that. Right, because he's like a, a biochemist. Yeah. So I'm saying, like he's, he, he's working to develop a cure for zombieism. Why is he a chief medical? Right. Oh, it was it was because he got kicked out of the CDC. Oh, that's, that's right. That's what it is. You're right, you're right. That's that what it was. It was kicked out of the CDC yeah. for doing I something unethical. That. And that's how we and ended up. And I just up. watched that like two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That yeah, may that's have been, right. Thank it you. may have been part of season three as to the reason why. It was. Oh, was it? it because that's why his mm -hmm. former boss. I yep. don't remember a whole lot of season three. So yeah. Everything that I liked about it, I thought happened in season three. And it turns out it happened in season one and two. I, so I, I really, and I didn't get to season three. I got to just the very beginning, like, to rewatch. Right. And it's been mm -hmm. so long since I watched it. So it's like... What the hell did I, what was in season three? I can't, yeah. I'm having a hard time, so you have to just jog yeah. my memory on that. We one. will but when we get anyways. there. Anyways. Did you want to add to that, Jen Kay? I know you had the, the reason that Kristen jumped in the mud. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in about the CDC thing. So I think they brought that up in the first episode. Yeah, yeah, I okay. think you're right. I think it was brought up. Very, Very casually yeah. in the first mm -hmm. episode yeah. and yeah. then really explored in the third season. But for me, what kept me going through it, weirdly enough, it was, well, it was a brain of the week. More common, it was like the crime of the week. But the range of like different roles that she's had to take on and like different brains and like personalities. Holy Lord. <laughs> like he has range. Mm -hmm. She does. Agree. That's one of the things that I think impressed me about the show was Rose McIver. I mean, yeah. what a role, Definitely. right? She gets mm -hmm. to play a whole bunch of different things. Some are more successful than others. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for sure. It's mm -hmm. so fun to watch her take on whatever the personality traits are. I love that she, when she prepares her brains with all of the different recipes, there's always a moment where she's going, mm, <laughs> right after it. Yeah. <laughs> because it all tastes good, of course, because it has brains. <laughs> but, she, yeah, she's super impressive. And she did play Tinkerbell on Once Upon a Time. And that, that was not necessarily indicative of, like, no, a bunch of, you know, much. Random fact, she was also once a Power Ranger. Which what? Power Ranger? It was one of the later seasons, RPM. So, like, late 2000s. What? I'm going to have to take your word for that. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> I, I, I was watching it. Her history as a Power Ranger would explain some of her fighting scenes during the sh first season. Ah, yes. Good mm -hmm. point. Now that you bring that up. Yes, because she did do some karate. <laughs> yeah. She did. She did. In fact, what were some of her that was one of my. That was one of my favorite episodes. I, it was either in the end or middle of season one, or it was in two, early two she, she, she was a hitman yeah, very early well, on. Well, it was yeah. the the Asian brain that she ate, the guy, <laughs> that was part of the mob or the something. The blue cobra? Yeah, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the guy yeah. was friends with AJ. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she just realized that she knew karate. Oh, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That I, was I, fun to watch her discover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, wow, I can, I can kick ass. <laughs> I was just going to say that was from episode four. That's all I was going to say. Jen K, I think you're really into this show. You know what? names and episode numbers in the whole nine yards. <laughs> A little obsessed. True confessions. <laughs> well, that's cool. Awesome. Yes, indeed. What are some of the other brains of the week? I, I like to list those out for you in your talking point benefit, but let's see. In season one, she was a painter. 
a hitman, a skydiver who just took a bunch of risks. That's basically, she was a risk taker. An agoraphobic hacker. Oh, yeah, I like that one. Mm -hmm. A maternal yeah, type because mm -hmm. it was a pregnant woman's brain she ate. Mm -hmm. A radio host with astute psychological insight. A sniper turned paintball instructor. And an alcoholic reporter, among others. So let's talk about the characters themselves. I mean, we've already hedged into Ravi. Mm -hmm. So please gush. Your cue is now. Oh, I, oh. <laughs> I, I love, yeah, the actor. He's he's good. Well, has he been in anything else? I have never seen him I've in anything. I've never seen him in anything else. I mean, he's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he's awesome. Is he truly British or is he? I think so. I think he is. Let me, he? I will go to the magical Google machine. <laughs> but anyway, he's just, I, I love him. And he's cute. Yeah, he is yes. cute. He is, he is very attractive. He's a fine he's specimen. <laughs> he's a fine specimen. No, but he's he's a great actor, and I love that character. And he he's having fun with it. You can tell. I mean, and the chemistry between him and Liv. Oh, it's great. Is great. And mm -hmm. yeah. actually, his and chemistry Peyton, with every everybody, everybody, everybody yeah, is great. Is his great. scenes with Blaine are hilarious. Yeah. His scenes with Major are hilarious. And Blaine, I love him. Yeah, he oh. is so mm -hmm. freaking good too. Yeah, David Anders is just yeah. outstanding. Yeah. He is so I love it when he sings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are my some of my favorite episodes is the singing ones. Yeah. But I think out of all of the characters, my least favorite would probably be Major. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah I can't really? as much as I, I At times please. he's good, and then other times uh, I don't know what it is. I can't get behind this. Uh, well, <laughs> I also think Major is hot. I just want to say is. that, especially he's when he takes his shirt off. Man. He's a good, yeah. And I also, I like that he has different shades. It's more fun when he's a zombie, which is not this season. In this season, he's really struggling with why Liv broke up with him. Mm -hmm. and Which was stupid. Well, I mean, yeah, zombieism is a big life change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she should have told him the truth. Like, she but well, he wouldn't family. have believed her. I mean, no. come on. Yeah. He had to hear it from Donnie's twin brother in the mental yeah. hospital, Scott E. Which yeah. I forgot all about that I until I went back and watched it again. I was like, oh, yeah, I totally forgot about that whole thing, which was mm -hmm. cool, kind of a cool take. And that actor, he is good, too. He I, is. I, I think they him. kept him on longer because he was so charismatic. He was so good, he was so yeah. good yeah. But, no, I, 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 I like Major a lot. I like to look at Major. <laughs> <laughs> I like... The sense of humor he brings. I like his scenes with Ravi, which I don't think they start living together until season two. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I no, I like I like Major a lot, and I can't get behind that. If I was gonna pick a least favorite, it would probably be Peyton, just because she's in and out. But yeah, I still like her. Yeah, I like her too. But yeah, she would. Yeah, be, she's probably yeah. They're yeah. about at the same level for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. Peyton and Major. Yeah. So quickly <laughs> circling back to the actor who plays Ravi. This is really his first big thing. Otherwise, he made appearances on the YouTube channel Funhouse. Huh. That was it. So really, he's done a few things, but it's been pretty much I Zombie, and he did. Oh, he did make one appearance on Supergirl when? in 2017 as Jack Spear slash Biomax. Oh, he was a villain. Oh. He was a villain. Yeah, I mean, but this is pretty much his big claim to fame as iZombie. I was going to comment more on that. He played one of, I think he was, he was previously, his character was previously in a relationship with Lena Luthor. So that's how they knew each other. Uh, oh, was he the nanobot guy? Yes. Oh! Crazy. Yeah. There you go. I yep. did not recognize him. Uh uh. But man, yeah, give this guy more work. He's awesome. Yeah, he's. I love him. He is my favorite character. Mm -hmm. too. I think he's my favorite character. He's he's just yeah. the best. You agree? Yes. Blaine. You really like Blaine? Yes. Just cause I don't know. He's good to. He's nice to look at. Sure. I don't know. I'm used to see him up. Or David Anders in roles kind of similar to that, where he plays the antagonist, not necessarily like the full on bad guy. Mm -hmm. So, but I think with that one, it, this one's just like a little more complex, especially once you get into season two and we meet his dad. But fun facts: when the time came around for him to, I think he had to like completely bleach his hair for the role. He actually got tips from it from the guy who plays Spike in Buffy. Oh, for real? That's a great oh. fun fact. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because and then, I, I love him. him. <laughs> Another fun fact. 
fun fact. <laughs> David Anders was also on Once Upon a Time. True. He, he played, you know, Dr. Whale or Dr. Frankenstein, essentially. He did. And he made a guest appearance after oh. iZombie had started when he'd already bleached his hair. He had to come back to Once Upon a Time, and for whatever reason, they didn't put him in a wig. So they made a joke about his new hairstyle oh. on the show as a reference to... That would have gone completely over else. my head. Yeah. <laughs> I caught it because I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. He's an eye zombie. I love David Anders. Yes. He's he, he is nice to look at. He was great on Alias. That's how I know him as well. I watched Alias as well. and I enjoy him immensely. He's morally complex, like you said. Mm -hmm. He's got layers. I think he's basically just opportunistic. He is. It's hard to say villain because he's not... Yeah, it's very much what's going to be best for me, what's going to get me ahead. And get me money. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So what about sort of the arc of season one? Because each season does have an arc apart from the brains. Also, we haven't talked about Clive. I feel we should talk about Clive. Oh, Clive, yeah. I like him. I think he's, he's good. He's okay. just a little bit above Major and Peyton for me. And it's not the actor and things, it's just that character. No. Yeah, at this He's the straight um, man. Yeah, he yeah. is. I mean, yeah. he, I think in the later seasons, he really starts to yeah, definitely. expand a little bit more. But I think really in the beginning, he he had to play it, the straight yeah. man. He was, you know, he yeah. couldn't know what was going on. So it would be that big build up to when they finally told him, include him in what Liv was actually doing. Yeah, I definitely think that once he found out what was going yeah. on that that's when he really his character started to blossom more and kind of chime in and mesh with the others because mm -hmm. he was part of the crowd now he knew yeah. everything you know what was going on so the arc of season one ultimately and I'll, I'll just say that i like clive too i think i like him more later but yeah mm -hmm. you know he's just he's basically playing the cop and he's yeah. In season one, it's not a comfortable partnership yet, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of establishment there. But the, the big arc of season one is that they're trying to figure out how the whole zombie business came to be. And Ravi does start to look at the possibility of curing with his many rats, most of which he names after Star Wars things. So there you go. Mm -hmm. We should mention, or I mentioned in the intro, that this show is created by, co-created by Rob Thomas, who created Veronica Mars. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you watched that, but he's deeply, deeply, deeply in the nerdy pop culture himself, mm -hmm. which permeates this show happily for me anyway. In fact, somebody mm -hmm. compared this to Buffy at one point, that it had a very Buffy-esque vibe, and I would actually agree with yeah, that. It's, it's very modern Buffy. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You know, it's it's definitely got, it's a product of its time, but it's still got that snappy dialogue. It's got all of the pop culture references that will probably date it in 10 years. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But I just think it's so witty and clever. And mm -hmm. I think that's because it's Rob Thomas, personally. I agree. But, but the big arc of season one is that we, we are learning how the zombie curse or the zombie virus came to be. We're learning about sort of the different relationships that these characters have with each other. We're also learning about Blaine and kind of his, his big, the big arc of season one is that Blaine is trying to turn brain eating into, because he is actually ground zero for this business, trying to turn brain eating into a business where he sells brains to hungry zombies for thousands of dollars a pop. At the meat cute, M E A T hyphen cute. <laughs> and people kind are kind of sussing out. Major is starting to suspect things. Liv is very cagey. You know, Clive is investigating and finding different disappearances that lead him to suspect Blaine. So that's kind of the progress of season one. What did you think about all of that as its first season out? I think it was good because they had to do a lot of setup. Mm -hmm. for the rest of the series to make sense like we had to see you know essentially from day one of Liv you know here's her normal life you know this is what it's like and then oh look this happens and then it's setting up all these characters the zombie lore that they're going to be taking through the rest of the show yeah and then really setting up Blaine as the main antagonist because he really is mm -hmm. the main antagonist throughout the series even though they do work together occasionally sometimes yeah, but I think there are bigger antagonists in future seasons. There are, yeah, but as the consistent antagonist. Sure. Or the anti-hero, maybe. Anti-hero, I maybe think that's Maybe it's a better fair. term for Blaine. 
Well, yeah. I think he becomes an anti-hero for sure. Yeah. I don't know. I liked the setup. I liked the different mechanisms that they used. You're right. They mm-hmm. spend more time on the procedural element of it. But the big kind of surprise twist of the season was learning that, first of all, there's this fictional drug, Utopium, that's part of the zombie virus or how it comes to be it's tainted but it's mixed with an energy drink Mm -hmm. called max rager Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is led a company that manufactures it led by von duclark played by longtime tv vet steven weber those of us from the 80s will Mm -hmm. remember him from wings yes yes (laughs) and for the new people he's, he's the principal on 13 reasons why that is true. Yep. When I was watching 13 Reasons Why, and he came up as the principal, I was like, what's Bondu Clark doing here? <laughs> Just being a principal? Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't seem like a good fit. <laughs> so I just thought, you know, all of that was pretty clever, kind of setting that up. And, of course, the first, the first character to learn of Liv's secret is her best friend, Peyton, and roommate, because she goes quote, full-on zombie mode, trying to get one of Max Rager's hitmen, because they're fully aware of the effects of their energy drink mixed with the drug. Mm -hmm. They figure out that they're the cause or the inadvertent contributor to the zombie virus and Mm -hmm. end up sending a hitman after, named Sebastian, coincidentally, after Liv. Liv fends them off in full-on zombie mode. That's when their eyes go red and they look like any other zombie that we've ever seen before. But Peyton happens to catch her in the act and then bolts. She leaves. She runs away. She's frightened out of her mind. What their do you friendship think? disintegrates for a while. Yeah. In the blink Can you room. blame her? <laughs> well, no. I, mean, I don't know how I would react if I saw my yeah. best friend kill turn into a zombie and killing somebody. True, I suppose. It's a lot to take in. It is a lot to take. Well, and she was kind of killing the guy at the time, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, she was. You in her self-defense, though, he was trying to kill her. Well, of course. Yeah. I don't know if Peyton knew that. Well, I don't know if she did it, probably. Of course, Peyton is a district attorney, we should mention. And she first hooks up with Ravi in this season. What do we think Which about I the th- couplings? At first, I felt it was a weird combination. But later on, it makes sense in a way, weird way. <laughs> but yeah, I like them together. I didn't at first. <laughs> Why didn't you at first? I just thought it was a weird combination. I didn't, they're so different. Their characters are... Opposites of Yeah, right. I know, but... <laughs> you were unimpressed. Yeah, I wasn't impressed. Her expression was I one was of squunchy but... face. <laughs> <laughs> and it might be because I was not really feeling the Peyton character at first yeah as I get to like her later on but I, I thought Ravi was the first one they'll find out about Liv well technically yes, yes. Ravi was the first one I did say that earlier but I mean apart from Ravi apart from the which more don't you find employees. it weird that he knew so quickly but he's super smart you already yeah. brought that up yeah he is super smart, <laughs> he's CDC but... level smart that's why I like him and he's the biggest dork alive also why I like him. And he has an English accent. Yes. Also why I like him. <laughs> and he's super tall. Also why I like him. <laughs> What's not to like about Ravi? There isn't anything. Exactly. <laughs> I do like the drinking contest in, in season one. It just reminded me of the, between Peyton and him. He'd always, you know, she'd always out drink him. And Liv is like, I'm telling you, don't. <laughs> Why do you keep drinking with you? You're never gonna win. You always have this hangover the next day. I thought that was a funny, because it happened several times. He did, it well, it does because he was trying to impress right, her. Right. right, he was trying to impress her. Yeah, Poor she's guy. set up as kind of a partier. Yeah, outside of her district attorney life, and which is interesting. Which is weird because the actress doesn't look like she would be a party. No person. She looks more of like a sophisticated uppity kind of, <laughs> not snooty, but maybe a little bit more prim and proper. Yeah, yeah. I give her snooty. She has a yeah. snooty vibe. A little bit of snooty. Yeah. She I, was on Disney Channel. Was she? Yes. Or was she on Disney Channel? In a show called Phil of the Future, and then she was in a couple of the like Disney Channel original movies. Yeah, and she's part of a band. Allie and AJ. I've never heard of it's, any of this. Yeah. No, me either. Kind of, yeah. I'm showing my age here. And I'm showing my opposite age. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Oh, she was she was also in the movie Easy A. Oh, yep. She played the the friend Rhiannon. Oh. Yep. He was in Hellcats. That was originally on CW. I didn't watch that. Mm -hmm. no. Only lasted one season. Ah, uh, that's why. It was like legally blind because she wanted to study to be a lawyer, but in order to stay at the college that she was at, she had to get a cheerleading scholarship. Oh. And like a college cheer team there. Yeah, that doesn't sound like something I'd want to watch. No. Not that I'm all about the nerdy shows, but you probably <laughs> lost me at cheerleader, actually. <laughs> yeah. Unless there's vampires in it, I don't care. <laughs> No, there's not. Oh. <laughs> I can't, all I can, I've just got season two on my mind yeah. because I just finished it today. Okay. It's like, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of what else happened in season one. I mean, that was basically it. They, they explored the cause of the zombie virus. Yeah. They explored the early parts of the cure. Liv met Lowell, that artist who yeah. ended up, they were going to shoot Blaine and oh, Blaine yeah, shot Yeah, him. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which I thought that was sad. I did like that character. And at the, well, at the end of, probably we should talk about the end of the season because that was more of the biggest story piece of it. Mm -hmm. So in all of this stuff, we should mention that Liv had a family in season one. Yeah, they have disappeared since. <laughs> yes, yeah, they have. Yeah, they did, yeah. Which is only important in the sense that Major actually starts to track down. Because Major in the first season, if you recall, is a social worker. Mm -hmm. And he deals yes. with youth who have drug addiction. And specifically utopium addiction. And Blaine is kind of getting his brain supply for meat cute from vagrant youth on the streets. Mm -hmm. And so Major, just because that's who he is, starts to track down the disappearances, figures out that it's starting with Meet Cute and Blaine. Major gets captured by Blaine <laughs> and also Liv's brother applies for a job and gets hired at Meet Cute to be an unwitting delivery service for the brains. When Major figures that out, he's able to kind of break out and overpower, except he gets wounded in the process. And Liv has to scratch Major to save his life, turning him into a zombie. But then Ravi has made the first version of the cure, very, very experimentally, gives it to Liv. Liv hits Blaine with the cure and also hits Major with the cure. So they both, that all happens in the season finale of the first season. So what did we think about that? Because that's pretty good setup for season two. A lot happens. It's true. Yeah. Every season is dense. Like when I was writing the talking points, which our listeners know I do, I was like, wow, this list is really big for all of the short season that we have. There's a lot packed in one single episode each time because every episode has a crime or a brain that they're solving and then has a piece of the larger story kind of woven throughout and usually some major turn in it. Major turn. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> Major turned into a zombie. Wait. But I'm shh. Kristen just went to her own place. <laughs> I think as soon as I saw the fight starting to happen with Major being involved, it's like, okay, here we go. Like, you kind of had a feeling that he, mm -hmm. he was either going to die, which, unlikely, because he's the eye candy for the show, or he was going to be turned into a zombie. Wasn't entirely surprised, but I was more surprised, I think, that Liv ended up using the cure on him and Blaine and not on Major and herself. Like, she always passes it out. She does. It, it, it's become Because, well, time. you wouldn't have eyes on the egg if she... It's true. Right? I mean, well, they, they could work with it. Well, they could. They could. They could. They could. I'd still watch it. I mean, if she... Well, none of the cures, and we'll get into the yeah. other types, are fail or foolproof. Yeah. Right. Including the most recent one, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about when we get to season four. Ah, everybody feels real great about season one finale. <laughs> well, it, just, it sets up a new dynamic yeah. for Major's relationship with Liv, too. And it also is in... Jen, know, Jen S. just wants to talk about season two. <laughs> yeah. I just I'm feeling as though maybe it's a forcing I, of the segue. I was going to say, they were, they're setting it up to introduce a whole slew of new characters, but that's not... Season one. That's season, season two. Yeah. Jen S. Would you like to talk about <laughs> season two and I, what new characters are I set up? Happened in it. I think out of season two, my favorite thing was Blaine losing his memory mm -hmm. because he, he became this softer, gentler 
musician. Yeah. That's when he started to see yeah, all that's when musical he started, performances. Yeah. Yep. And he dated Peyton. And he dated Peyton. Which, was which, weird. which is really weird. weird. I was it's against still that. Weird. Really. It's still yeah. weird when they see each other. Yeah. Like, Spoiler, I, I, I like felt Peyton bad for Robbie, Robbie, too. I love like, Robbie Aww. and Peyton together. It makes so much more sense. So to set that up, <laughs> since we're talking about the memory loss, what happens is the cure, what we figure out is that it's temporary, and it also potentially leads to, so they can come back as a zombie. So the, the first version of the cure is temporary. Then they, they become a zombie again, and they eventually die. So while that happens, Ravi works on a second version of the cure. The second version of the cure, he gives to Blaine first and basically says, this is for you to stave off your death, but Blaine just pops it in right away. It's not tested. It's totally experimental. He says, only use it in emergency. Blaine, of course, doesn't do what he's told ever mm -hmm. and pops it in and then appears to lose his memory. We'll say that that way. So you were talking <laughs> about the memory loss. We also meet Gilda otherwise known as Rita Von Duclark's <laughs> daughter, who seems to be leading a double life. So let's talk about season two. What'd you like? And you have to talk about it. What'd you like? What didn't you like? Season two, anyway. is that when Major becomes the chaos killer? Yes. Was, yes. Okay. So Major, because he was given this zombie cure, he gets like a zombie, like a spidey sense. Like he's Major's human, mm -hmm. but his like, spidey senses go off when there's a zombie nearby mm -hmm. and so he is hired by the max rager corporation to go and eliminate zombies he's blackmailed into he's it. blackmailed into getting zombies off of the streets essentially even if they're nice normal parental figures because if he doesn't mm -hmm. then they'll kill Liv first yeah because yeah. they know that she's a zombie so because reed is living with her yes yeah. That's because why. Peyton left. Peyton left. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Major becomes the chaos killer, quote unquote, and turns out that that's that's when we we'll figure out like if you freeze a zombie, they don't die. They just they're in stasis. They're in stasis essentially. Max Rager starts doing experiments on some of Major's zombie victims. Yeah, in a basement, which they jokingly call Spokane, since they're in Seattle. But we can get into more of the after effects of that at the end of the season two. Yes. But I actually kind of liked that storyline. I did too. I did. I really, I liked it. I really liked it. I, I liked seeing Major struggle with it, you know, kind of more of a moral basis and also seeing how he was able to kind of keep up with it. I really liked season two. When mm -hmm. season three hit, I thought this is worse than season two. Season two was very, very engaging to me. I thought a lot of the brains of the week were really, really funny. And I liked the fact that they spent a lot of time exploring. So Liv and Major kind of rehook up in this season mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. well. But yep. that is when he is not a zombie and she is. And so they have to, what they figure out is that the zombie virus can be transmitted through sex mm -hmm. and that condoms don't work. They're not, they're too porous, I guess. <laughs> For the, for the zombie virus stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so. We need a birds and the bees talk for zombies. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> so there's a lot of fun exploration around how can they define their relationship if they're not really of the same species. Mm -hmm. Major gets addicted. He does. Mm -hmm. To the drug. Yep. Utopium. Yep. Which I didn't really care for that. I think it that could seemed have done a little out of out character of for him. Yeah, yeah, because here he is was a social worker helping teens who were addicted to that. Mm -hmm. Why would he turn around and? I mean, I know how he came upon came upon taking it, and you know, mm -hmm. it's basically one of those things. Once you take it the first time, you're hooked or whatever. I guess. Yeah. But still, I think I don't think they needed it. I don't think they. It was one that we weaker points of the season yeah. yeah it was they kind of made it after school special but they did explain yeah. it i mean yeah, he was basically did. doing it to escape how bad he felt about being the chaos killer yeah mm -hmm. and he of course took it the first time because they were trying to what are they trying to do in that nightclub that's yeah. right when him and robbie took it in yeah. the nightclub mm -hmm. because they needed that's to right. get the tainted 
utopium that was used at the original boat party. Not yes. Initially in that episode, like Robbie was the one, I think, that was going to be, like, well, I would say test subject. Like, he was going to be the one that was taking the utopium. He was, like, documenting his, like, symptoms and stuff. And Major was going to be the one making sure, like, he didn't do anything stupid or, like, potentially, like, life-threatening. But then Major kind of got into the slump. Like, obviously, you don't want to think about him being a chaos killer. That's when he takes the utop utopium. But agreed. It was, it was tedious. Probably the most tedious part of season two, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially because I do like Major, and I thought, oh, man, they're wasting his character. <laughs> I really like Major, too. I do. <laughs> I really like Major. He's more fun when he's a zombie. Yeah, yes. I would definitely. I agree. Yeah. But I still really like him. What else happened during the season? I feel like there was more. There was a lot. We meet Stacy oh. Boss. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Played by Eddie Jemison from the yeah. Oceans movies. Mr. Boss. <laughs> yep. Uh huh. Yes. Eat Blaine's dad for the first time. And we, yeah. We do. Who becomes a recurring uh. character until the fourth season. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. And his and name then, is Angus. Angus, yep. yeah. Angus McDonough. Oh, yeah. Major has the affair with. Gilda slash Frida. Yeah. 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 Gross. Gross. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, the actress, give it to her. She's a good actress because I didn't like the character. Yeah. She made me not like the character. She did a very well job. Very good job yeah. of being the spoiled little bitchy girl. I'm going to steal your boyfriend mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of person. You know what I mean? Like, she, she did, she's a good, she's a good actress. But I didn't like that character. Yeah. No. She looked really familiar, but she I... She did. She did look familiar to me, too. And I, I don't think she, I've seen her in anything else. Mm, I think she must remind me of somebody else. I I want to consult Google? Sh if you want. <laughs> <laughs> the magical Google machine. We're real-time researchers on this podcast. Oh, Clive? Also, isn't this when he has the girlfriend? He cop? needs Dale Bosley. Yeah, he needs Dale. FBI I like Dale. agent Dale. I like Dale her. really grew yeah. on me. I yeah. didn't like her too much at first. Yeah. But she's really grown on me. Yeah, me too. I agree. I didn't like Dale at first either. I, I kept thinking to myself, the chemistry is weird between these yeah. two. And I don't know. It did change at some point, but not until way after season two. Yeah. I was not along for the ride of their relationship at first at yeah. all. Yeah, I agree. They, their relationship, I think, was one of the good parts of season three, mm -hmm. which we'll get into when we get to season three next, but... Yeah, season two was just more of them kind of feeling mm -hmm. each other out and having Failing sex. each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not intentional. Um. There's a lot of sexy talk on this. Is this the... No, that's this next is, season. No, season two is when she eats the brain of the erotic fiction writer. Oh, oh yes! yes! The librarian. Yes. 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 And yep, she also has... Season. Liv gets a new boyfriend. Right. That's an undercover cop. Yeah. I can't think of his name, the character's name, but... Drake. Drake. Drake, yes. Drake. Who yes. also so, is very good looking. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. I could not find anything about the actress Rita. She was in, like, she was initially from Canada. I think she did some stuff in, for, like, Canadian films, but nothing really. But the guy that plays Drake, I recognize him because he played, oh, man, I'm blanking on his name. He was in Secret Life of the American Teenager. He was the football player boyfriend. Not of the main girl, but of the girl that wanted to wait until marriage to have sex. I'm going to have to take your word for that, Me too. too. <laughs> I, I don't remember, like, any of their characters. I just remember I hated Shaley Woodley, Woolsey, however the heck you say her last name. I just hated her so much during the show, but I couldn't stop watching it. <laughs> True Confessions of Jen J. That's oh, this episode. <laughs> But no, Drake is hot, and you're right. She did. She did meet him. Mm -hmm. He's also he becomes a zombie. Yeah, yeah. Or I think he was a zombie. No, you're right, because he, he was becomes, dying. She, she does it. She turns him into the zombie. Blame yep. to scratch him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she scratches. Yeah. And is that the first one she's turned? I think it was. No, it was Major was the first one. Oh, yeah, that's Major right. Was yeah, Major first. was yeah. first. Right. Which she had to grapple with her choice right. as yeah. well doing mm -hmm. that this season which is kind of foreshadowing now isn't it bum, bum, yeah bum. Four. not you know what happens in season four I don't know what, what does she start doing. doing anyway oh right yeah that <laughs> it just popped into my mind yeah, anyway a little foresh that's a little that's bit smart that mm -hmm. is smart let's see some of the brains of the week in season two Liv was a grumpy old man a frat boy bro. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. A real... I saw that one annoying. Yeah. The bro. I think it was the 
Bro. Was, that, was that the the one where she wore the crime scene tape dress? Yes. At the party? Yes. Yeah. And the main frat boy bro was the villain in Thirteen Reasons Why. Justin Prentice. He was the chief frat boy bro. Liv was also a real Seattle housewife, a country singer. Oh, we have a country mm -hmm. singer. I like that one. A youth basketball coach, a gambler. She bet on the horses. Yep. A magician. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I like that. That was one. fun. That was a good episode. That was a fun one. A stalker who made scrapbooks. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was actually, I actually like that one. Because that <laughs> one, no, because that actually brought out things dealing with Major and what he, he was keeping stuff secret and with Rita. And so her paranoia was drawing all of that out into the light. That's true. Yeah. And she also discovered the safe in the closet yeah. because of her stalker right. brain. Exactly. Which was where he was keeping all the chaos killer yeah. mm -hmm. tools, including the serum that was, mm -hmm. I guess, freezing them or was, putting them into a was, coma or something. Yeah, it was yeah. like putting them to sleep, essentially, and then yeah. Yeah. into the deep freeze. She was also a vigilante superhero. Oh, How appropriate for the I CW. I know. That was yeah. a little on the nose. Yeah, <laughs> that was a little bit kooky, that one. It was... It was that one was a little dumb. Yeah, it was a little <laughs> bit silly. dumb. And was it, I think, was it silly. The Fog? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The Fog. <laughs> they could have done better with it, but with all the other stuff that they had going on during the episode, I can see why it got sidelined a little. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm okay that it got sidelined. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was dumb. And then she was also a method actor on a zombie high. Zombie high. <laughs> zombie, uh, yeah, I like that. That episode was good. Mm -hmm. I love... So I have, this is a, a brilliant time to say this. One of my favorite aspects of this show is how meta self-referential it is. It makes side swipes at the CW. It makes side swipes at similar genre shows that everybody knows and loves, like Buffy and Supernatural, and including the superhero show, the Arrowverse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all of which are on the CW. I love the fact that it makes jokes about itself that they mm -hmm. say and then kind of boomerang. That's probably my favorite part. Yeah. So clever. That's probably why it gets a lot of references to Buffy with all of its pop culture mm -hmm. references. And, you know, now I am would assume if Buffy were in today, it would be very meta. Yes. So. But it really comes out during the zombie high because... <laughs> You got your sort of deep-seated CW backdrop with all the addictive... The vampire diaries yeah. and all that. Like the teeny, soapy romances. Right. With the overt melodrama of things like 13 Reasons Why, for mm -hmm. example. But then all the while, Liv is a super fan of the show and gets everybody else hooked on it, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I love that. I just want to say that. <laughs> And she was a sexy librarian. She was a social media influencer slash blogger, a pathological <laughs> liar, the the criminal that lied about everything, the uber yep. positive barista, a research scientist, which was very similar to her other you know normal life, a stripper, mm -hmm. and a type A student posing as a drug deal informant. That, those were all of our brains of the week. I will say, I, I don't think my favorite brain of the week hit until season three. Okay. Which we'll get into. Mine too, <laughs> which we'll get into. What else to happen during season two? They raided Max Rager at the very end. Of they the did yeah. raid yeah. Max Rager. And can Rager. I just say real quick, my favorite part about that episode was being very meta. with Because the creator of the show is Rob Thomas. Yeah. Which That's most people don't differentiate the creator, Rob Thomas, from Max, Matchbox 20, Rob mm -hmm. Thomas. And so what did they do? They played a little fun name game, and they killed the singer Rob Thomas yep. at the Max Rager party. His brain was eaten by zombies. Who then, one of them, pr proceeded to sing semi-competently unwell by yep. Matchbox 20. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I liked that little, that little yeah. dig at, you know, because you see, created by Rob Thomas, and then yeah. the other Rob Thomas. Yeah. I, I just thought that was a really funny way of... We should spend some time talking about Don E because Don E becomes huge. A bigger player. And I really just think it's his charisma and his mm -hmm. chemistry with David Anders, honestly. Yeah. I mean, the guy is basically just a stooge, but he's an ambitious stooge. And then mm -hmm. becomes a zombie stooge. Mm -hmm. He has Chief, the other big guy, silent oh, type. Chief. Yeah. R.I.P. Chief. For realsies. <laughs> Shot in the head. Yes. Yeah. Not just undead. Dead, 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 dead. dead. <laughs> Not coming back, dead. 
So he <laughs> scratches Donnie at Donnie's request, and this happens during Blaine's memory loss. Yeah, because yeah. this yep. is when Donnie tries to take over the business. Yep. Which is, they're selling brains out of the basement of a funeral parlor. That's how Blaine continues Started. his business. Yeah. yeah. Also, in season two, Clive finally finds out about zombies. Yeah. That's yep. true. That, yep, and that's... Yeah. It happens before the Max Rager raid, which is yeah. fun to say. Because well, they caught me, they caught Major as the chaos killer. Of course, he reverted back to being a zombie. But if he was in jail and he didn't feed, then there could. I think they talked about potentially having a big zombie apocalypse breakout. Yeah, yeah. So. And then they actually release him on bail, but Dale starts to suspect that he's also the meat cute killer. So they rearrest him, <laughs> and that's kind of how this all comes out. So because he's still a zombie. Liv basically pleads with Clive to let, you know, get him to let Major go or mm -hmm. he's going to start this outbreak. And in order to convince Clive that this is the right thing to do, she stabs herself so that she'll go full on zombie, zombie in front of him and reveals <laughs> the existence of zombies and the fact that she's been a zombie the whole time mm -hmm. with Clive. Which she's yep. not psychic-ish. She is zombie and eating the brain. Yeah. Yes. Which is an interesting twist for, I think, the show, because up until that point, Clive is the straight man, was basically just reacting to all of Liv's crazy personalities on the yeah. brains. Mm -hmm. yeah. He ended up eating a brain by accident, I think, at one point, Yeah, too. on pizza. Yeah. I love that episode, when they, they, she had put the brains on the pizza, and he came in, oh, pizza! Uh, yeah. Oh, is that mushrooms? I don't like mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I forgot that. But that. also with him, I think he was starting to suspect something, something was wasn't on. right because he kept saying how you know Liz is taking on the personalities of these victims yeah yeah he was so starting, I think he was starting to piece yeah. so maybe that was like a setup for him because you if you think about it it's like how is he going to handle this right big thing you know so maybe he kind of in the back of his head or was piecing it together sure mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> he was piecing things together no you're right mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you're right, Clive found out, and it changed the show quite a bit. Yeah. I think it made it better. It had to. Yeah, it had to. I, I mean, think. really, they couldn't go more than mm -mm. the end of the second season without informing the partner. Like, that gag is only good for so long. Right. It has a limited shelf life. Yeah. You need to bring the partner in on it. Definitely. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I have nothing further to add. <laughs> Just so we did get to film more graves at the end, because they come in and save the party. That's true. But at that time, they're led by Vivian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we didn't meet who we would we meet later on. Yeah, because we didn't know that she was a zombie until the very end. She's one of the people picking off musician Rob Thomas's yeah. brain. And that's kind of yep. where it yeah. ends. She also, they bought Max Rager. That's they how did. this all started. She tells how she became a zombie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or her husband or whatever. Not until season three. Yeah. Oh, that is in season three. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah, all of this kind of ha That's why I liked the season. That season finale had a really, really mm -hmm. good impact. It did. And I really, really, really started to re want to know what happened next. Yeah, like, I mean, oh it, my it gosh. It changed the show. It did. Yeah. They really took a big leap in the writer's room, and I'm really happy that they did. I think the writer's room takes big leaps all the time, though. I think one mm -hmm. of the... the I mean, maybe maybe not so much in season three, and I think we're kind of building toward the segue, but I think that they kind of push the envelope a lot, just not necessarily in big, the mm -hmm. big leap like here, because it's a finale. But I think every episode they do something kind of crazy and unique, just, mm -hmm. just for the show that we're watching. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I really like the writers. I think they're doing a f tremendous job. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Yeah. I agree. But I guess we should talk about season three now. I think everybody's kind of wanting to talk about season three and season four. And season four, of course, will be part of the second episode of this miniseries. But we should talk about season three. Season three goes back to his spring release and 13 episodes. And we get introduced, as Jen noted, Jen S. noted, to Fillmore Graves, which is a military contractor. They buy out Max Rager for a billion dollars. And we find out they're an all-zombie military contractor force who are A, establishing a zombie island where zombies can go live their zombie days, and B, trying to minimize the risk of so-called D-Day or Discovery Day when humans realize that zombies exist. What did we think of Season 3? What did you like? What didn't you like? 
Well, it all started off with Fillmore and Graves covering up what actually happened at the Max Rager event. Yes, which then led to a highly allegorical zombie truther movement. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Because one of the employees was the brother of this lead sort of... Conspiracy theorist? Mm-hmm. Slash supremacist of a type. Yep. <laughs> so... Mm-hmm. Which to me, if we're talking about on the nose, this felt a little on the nose. It did. Like they were going for, and I think this is one of the reasons that the season dragged. They really tried to go for something that was topical and current and allegorical. And while I applaud shows and and fiction that at least acknowledges our times, I don't know that I wanted to watch it in the show. At least not like the way that they tried to do it either. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a way, obviously, they could have done it to make it worse or make it better, but I think the way they did it, it just made it seem like it dragged on for way too long. Yes. Especially with only 13 episodes in the season. Yes. Yeah. It definitely felt a lot longer than 13 episodes. I mean, season it two did. seemed to fly by with 19 just because of the pacing mm-hmm. and the story, but season three, even though it was back to the 13 order, it was hard to get through. It was hard mm-hmm. to get it was. through. There was a time when I was starting to get distracted by other TV shows. Yeah, same. Me too. Same. Yeah. Yeah, there was times when I actually stopped watching season yeah. three entirely for a couple of weeks. And yeah, then oh, finally me too. Went I had like it. three, four episodes piled up because I was already into mm-hmm. something else because I'd lost interest in yeah, it. Yeah, and so. for me, a big part of that was the, the zombie the, truther yeah, movement. It, yeah, that's what I really agree. bogged down this season. So the other piece that I didn't really like was Caddy Cups, Ravi's former, former boss, boss at the CDC. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah, I thought yeah. what a tremendously yeah. superfluous yeah. and annoying yeah, character, her yeah. and was happy when she got eaten. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, right. Although yeah, then Liv ate her. Yeah, I think one of the more emotional checkpoints for me in this season was was with Clive, and it was with the neighbor and her son, single mother and her son that he had gotten oh, yeah. really close to. Mm-hmm. You know, he never really knew. He kind of lost touch with them over the years, and then. When they're taking a tour of Fillmore Graves, or they do a little zombie mm-hmm. school, so the kids will feel safe. And he sees this young kid. This Wally. Wally. Wally, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He sees Wally and in the zombie school, and they kind of reconnect. And ends up, you know, later, either later that episode or the episode after, the zombie truther people, they had figured out that Wally and his mom were zombies and they ended up executing them. And that was the murder investigation of the week for that particular episode later on. That one kind of hit, hit me. Yeah. That was I think that was a really good opportunity to really stretch Clive's character a little bit too mm-hmm. and to kind of make him the forefront. Actually, that wasn't it wasn't wrapped up in an episode. It was kind of an underlying yeah, arc for the season, for season. Mm-hmm. because Clive recused himself from the case because of his personal connection. Mm-hmm. And Chavanaugh, yeah. the rival detective, did led the investigation, but they were still kind of sneak because Clive was personally invested. They yeah. were, him and Liv were still trying to suss out who could possibly have done it, mm-hmm. because I think. Clive was always planning on a little personal vendetta because he was yeah. he was involved in an emotional way with the what with the mother with the, with the mother yeah. and the mom yeah. who was had left an abusive husband after mm-hmm. he got arrested mm-hmm. yeah. so but you're right there was a lot of layer in that mm-hmm. a lot of emotion I feel like that was the first time we really got more drama mm-hmm. than out and out comedy with this particular piece we also got a lot of interesting insight into the relationship between Blaine and his father between the two seasons seasons two and three because he didn't put him he didn't drop him to the bottom of the well until that was in season four wasn't it that was the end of season three end of season oh, it was three. at the end of season three. yeah and I'm not exactly sure quite the series of events but I can say that Angus was one of Major's so-called chaos victims, right. and then he was unfrozen. Then he um, freezes them, right? Yes. Oh, that's right, because they're going to start was, the scratching yeah, post. Yeah. yeah. Right. I remembered something. Good job, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Jen S. I just really, I just really struggled with season three. Like, I just, yeah, it was very wacky, and it, and it has to be, it was all this truth or stuff going on was too much for me. It was not interesting. Major starts to work for Fillmore Graves because... Being branded the chaos killer, he can't get a job anywhere else. But he does so as a human. The one thing I really didn't like was he randomly dated the his like internet the internet fan Shauna. Ugh. Yeah, and then she was like 
social media, Instagram, Tumblr, like everything for it. No. Yeah, she just spread everything all over. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That did seem very desperate on his part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was annoying. So I concur. Liv becomes a dominatrix in this one. Let's go through her brains of the week here. So one of my favorite episodes, there are several favorite episodes, actually, despite the fact that season three is kind of a mixed bag. There are a couple of favorite episodes of the whole series for me in this season. One of them is when Liv eats the dad brain and Major eats the teenage girl brain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Major yeah. the teenage girl yes. brain is my favorite that, brain that. of the week. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I forgot all about that. I don't I, know why I chose to black out season three so much, but yeah, I'm remembering now mm-hmm. you guys talking about this. Yes. The, brain, the brains were good. Everything else kind of leading up to it and, like, filling it in was kind of meh. We can say it like that. Agreed. I would concur with that as well. Let's see. So we had that. Liv was also a mindfulness, quote-unquote, yoga instructor, an office gossip, a dominatrix for quite a few episodes, actually, a narcissistic DJ, a preschool teacher, a womanizing preschool teacher, an internet stuntman in the flavor of jackass, and then my other favorite one of the week. The D&D? The D&D I one. love it. I think that, that probably is my favorite favorite one. Oh my gosh. Let's just right. talk about this for a second. Well, because I, I often say, especially if you listen to our Stranger Things episode, I am, I am not an aficionado of Dungeons & Dragons. I have a lot of nerdy things. For some reason in my brain, I've drawn the line at D&D. I've never been able to sit down and play it. Because a lot of what happens reminds me of what played out on the show. It's pretty accurate. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I used to play D&D. Uh-huh, uh-huh. A-D&D, Advanced D&D. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Oh. I grew up with a lot of brothers. They all played that, so. So they it was very were advanced. Very reminiscent of that time. Well, all I have to say, I love the fact that Liv had this wizard hat on. I love the fact that, now we failed to mention that Clive is a huge Game of Thrones fan. Mm -hmm. Throughout the series, they establish his love for the Game of Thrones, which we can all relate to. But then he sits down to play Dungeons and Dragons. He's one of the most skeptical of the four. And he totally becomes so into it that it's a running gag (laughs) for other season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Major gets really into it. And then Robbie, Robbie gets, gets really, really into, into it. it. And Peyton doesn't give a care whatsoever. <laughs> In fact, she dies early. <laughs> She's like, okay, I'm dead. <laughs> it was the best episode ever of mm-hmm. iZombie. My favorite brain, though, I gotta say, it was, I really liked her as a preschool teacher. Really? Yeah. I don't know. It's just kind of funny having someone who's like used to talking with like five year olds, especially like in the like interrogation room, talking about murder and stuff. And then she, I think there's one part of it where she goes like, bring, she has like a sock puppet with her. She goes up to like try and like bring it up to talk, and Clive's like, no. It's <laughs> <laughs> true. They open the scratching post. That's very important. We also meet the the CEO of Cha- of Fillmore Graves, which is Chase Graves, mm-hmm. played by Veronica Mars vet Jason Doring, who has really filled out. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good looking man too. He yeah, is. Not bad. Did you see he's him pretty... with his shirt off? Uh huh. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> he did not used to look like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, somebody might like the guys on the show. That uh, somebody might be me. <laughs> So they meet him. He's really super serious. He's like not even, he doesn't have much of a sense of humor. And his whole business is that he's trying to live the dream of Zombie Island and all this other stuff. The biggest plot point, I think part of the reason why this season was so weak is because the major mystery out of all of this is that a Fillmore Graves employee whose name is Carrie Gold Carrie Gold, that sort of Brit- another British woman mm-hmm. in yes. Fillmore Graves, because she does not agree with the zombie island mm-hmm. thing, wants to bring about D-Day, and it's suggested that she orchestrates everything. She orchestrates mm. the zombie truthers, she orchestrates Wally's and his mother's execution, she orchestrates the fact that things get released 
oh, Liv also dates Justin, the former DJ turned Fillmore Graves soldier. Mm -hmm. We haven't even talked about Justin, although oh, yeah. he, she, oh, Justin. he was my least yeah. favorite of her people. It was mine too. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, there's at one point where they're trying to capture a zombie and then the truthers catch him on video in full on rage mode or Romero mode. So all mm -hmm. of this stuff comes down to her machination and they don't even set her up as kind of like somebody who would be capable, number one, or somebody yeah. we should even begin to suspect as like a mastermind like that. Yeah. And I think that's that was a little bit of shoddy writing for the series. She also orchestrated the helicopter crash that killed Bill Vivian. Yeah, she did. She did a lot of stuff. And she yeah. came out, I mean, she was in maybe three episodes the whole time. And then she brought the actual, like, flu virus to Seattle, right? The, like, super deadly one. Yeah. But it was that virus, they call it the Aleutian flu, which would be, like, Alaskan, but okay. They said she brought it from Paris. But was that really real, or was that just something they were using to mask the yeah. zombie virus? It's, well, it's something they were using to mask the zombie virus in order to use the vac the vaccinations to as a way to people. infect more people unintentionally. Right. right. Yes. So I didn't get the sense that the flu was real. No. But when that reveal came for people infecting the vaccine with the virus, that was just like mind blown. Yeah, and one of the victims was Dale. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, being proactive and getting the vaccine and Clive got there just after the shot was being taken out of her arm. It's true. He was super close to getting it himself, too, because he was, like, the next in line. And it also got Johnny Frost, the mm -hmm. journalist. Oh, journalist. journalist. Whatever he is. The, the weather guy? He's the anchorman. Or he something. was the weather, weather guy. guy. He got Very promoted yeah. in <laughs> season two. That's right. Yeah, he bounces around a little bit. Yeah, for some reason, even though he's kind of adult, but whatever. <laughs> He gets infected, and then Liv shows up at the TV. She gets the idea to show up at the TV station and mm -hmm. get him to broadcast that the vaccine is actually source of zombie. Zombieism. That, yeah. yeah, zombieism, that zombies are real, that everybody needs to kind of do this thing. So that, that was the plot on season three, basically. All the while, Robbie gets a vaccine going again, and the very last moments of season three are he volunteers himself as a test subject mm -hmm. and has Liv scratch him. And <laughs> the only thing you know is that it goes to black, and he says, oh, something about being best friends, and she says, don't be a dick. And they say they love each other, which is very yeah. sweet. Everybody cares. Man! It's like you're zombies yourself. <laughs> did you eat some brains? Did you get scratched? Oh, I did. <laughs> prove it. <laughs> prove it, prove it, prove it. So seasons one through three, take turns. Give me your feeling about the first three seasons of the show. Very solid seasons, even with the slight lull of the zombie truther plot line in season three. Solid. Definitely one that I've enjoyed watching. I can easily see myself going back and watching it again once the series is done. I think the series already has rewatchability just based on the first three seasons. <laughs> it definitely has for me. It's another Buffy. I, I've rewatched oh. it like three times now. But I, I've already watched the first two. I'm going to go back and finish watching, well, the third season. And into the, I've already watched the fourth, but I'll watch it all over again mm -hmm. before the fifth comes out. So the last one. Yeah, really like it. I think it's setting it up pretty well for the ending. So very good. Got me super excited for season four. And I, as soon as the last episode of season three came out, I was like, but, but I, I want more. Like, don't we get more? I was like, I don't know how I made it through the, how long it was till season four. They really didn't, like, after season three, she, like, they obviously said that there was going to be season four, but they, like, kept it mostly under wraps for what they were planning to do and not really have, like, a lot of, like, teasers or anything, even at, like, the time when Comic-Con was going on, too. It's true. They have been pretty tight-lipped on teasers, generally speaking, through the course of the show. I mean, mm -hmm. even, pr like I said, prior to its first airing, they did not have a trailer for it. I think that's actually worked to its advantage. But I would agree that the first three seasons are super solid. Even if you're not a fan of procedurals, like I am not, if you like something like Bones, which is procedural with a twist, you're going to like iZombie. And each season, even including season three, particularly with the season finale, did, just like Jen K. just said, leave me wanting more. 
and more and more and more. But we'll talk about just how much more when we get to the second episode of this series. But since we're taking a first look, I now get to ask these fun questions, okay? Okay. So the show was created by Rob Thomas and Diane Ruggiero Wright. Thomas previously created, as I've mentioned, Cupid, Veronica Mars, the 90210 reboot, mm. not the original one, and Party <laughs> Down. Diane Ruggiero Wright previously created That's Life and The X List, both of which did not last long, though she was a writer on Veronica Mars. What do you think of this collaboration? They're first as co-creators. Would you watch any other shows on which they collaborate to create? Would you watch any shows they've created by themselves? What do you think about this whole I zombie business compared? Why or why not? Etc. So Veronica Mars has been on my two watch list since it came out. I've just never actually sat down to do it. So, but having watched iZombie and really liking iZombie, I know that I definitely want to check out Veronica Mars now. I'm secretly hoping that Kristen Bell makes a cameo in iZombie at some point. She did. She, she did. made she a did. voice. Mm-hmm. A voice cameo. She was the voice of... What was she the voice of? She did something. It was in season two. Oh. Yep. Was it in season two? Was it in season... It was season one or two. It was one of the first two seasons. And it's uncredited, so you have to go to the specific episode to find it. But somebody made a reference to Kristen Bell, like, oh, Kristen Bell, I really like yeah. her. That was oh. Liv. Yeah, oh, yeah. you're right. I think that was in season one. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I think that was season, in season hey, at the end of okay. season one, or maybe at the very beginning of season one. I'm okay. looking it up on Google right now. Okay. While you're doing that. Okay, I got it. Oh, go I ahead. got it. So she appeared in the season two, the episode Fifty Shades of Grey Matter, where that's the one where... Liv eats the librarian, librarian. erotic fiction writer, right. the horny librarian. And so Kristen Bell provided narration That's for the right. audio book. The yes. audio book. Yep. Yes. yes. Yep. So I, I don't know if she'll be able to make a physical cameo just because she's on the good place right now and is otherwise busy and married to what's his name but Dax Shepard but I've only seen parts of Veronica Mars I've always wanted to go back and watch the whole thing it's one of those (laughs) kind of cult favorites I've also wanted to watch Party Down yet another cult I've never heard of that one it lasted one season but people who watched it love it Hmm. it's ranked consistently as one of the top cult shows of all time oh just because he is a a fantastically clever writer I love iZombie's whole mode and Mm -hmm. pacing and wit Mm -hmm. and everything about it and I think that he's carried that over I will never watch the 90210 reboot on principle I'm just going to say that right now (laughs) because I watched the original 90210 Mm -hmm. so boo on the anything else and I'm not going to watch Diane's other shows just because frankly I've never heard of them and I think they were cancelled but if they ever came out and created something together again Heck yeah. yeah. I would I would show up for that. How does iZombie compare to other TV shows, other genre shows, including zombie fiction, horror comedy, and comic book adaptations, because that's really the three that we're covering, mm. or other procedural comedy dramas like Bones? It is so different, and it combines so many like different elements. From what I heard for the... I haven't read the comic book or the graphic novel but from what i heard it doesn't really follow it that closely like i think it's just like loosely based off of it i mean i don't think you can compare it to other things like the walking dead it's much much different than that Mm -hmm. but i think we've compared it to buffy and i would hold to that comparison Mm -hmm. i would Mm -hmm. also compare it to bones i don't know if anybody watched bones and obviously that's a straightforward real life scenario Mm -hmm. she's a forensic anthropologist Mm -hmm. not a zombie But you have those quirks of personality, you have sort of an emotional detective, only he's an FBI agent. You've got the surrounding cast of extremely quirky characters and a bunch of dark humor running through it. I mean, I think it it actually bears a lot of similarity to Bones. The murders are more gruesome than Bones because she has to use her smarts to figure things out. But I think if you put Buffy and Bones together, you basically have this show with the added effect of the recipes featuring brains. Which I think was brilliant. (laughs) It is brilliant. She's also quite creative with the toaster oven. I just want to say that. I mean, how can she make half the crap she makes in the toaster oven? Okay. Yeah. I'm hoping at some point that they come out with, like, a mock cookbook of all the different zombie recipes. 
Oh my gosh. That would be so awesome. You should write them. That's a brilliant <laughs> idea. TM, JK. Like, make them like actually edible where it's like, these are just decorative brain pieces, not actual brains. So don't use actual brains in this. Mm-hmm. They'll be mushrooms. <laughs> Since so apparently the texture is the same. Oh. <laughs> Oh. oh, I like mushrooms. I like mushrooms. <laughs> I did. <laughs> that episode. Oh, come on. You don't know what brains yeah. taste like. <laughs> like, right after that. Would you recommend iZombie to others? Why or why not? Yes. Yeah. I would it be cross. There's cross genre appeal. <laughs> I would be selective, though, because I have suggested it to other zombie goers who do not feel the same way about it as I do. They're Why? like anti I zombie. They hate it because it is nothing like zombies. Like true. Like The Walking Dead is what they compared it to. Like that's how it would be if there were zombies. They need to not take that zombie stuff so I know, seriously. Right? Yeah. Right? Come on. Love I mean, that's why I didn't like iZombie, because it is so different than it's that. It's a different take on it. It is. It is. And it's a fun, fresh, uplifting take instead of this depressing... Well, don't get me wrong. I'm a big Walking Dead fan. But, but everybody dies. But, yeah, everybody <laughs> does die. I mean, not that I've watched a lot. This is just what I hear. No, they do. I successfully converted a couple of people to watch it, including one of my old friends from college. So whenever there was a new episode that came out, we both got to watch it. We would just, like, we have, like, a text going back and forth about what happened and like who we felt was cute and that kind of stuff or just like oh my god can you believe that happened so you you're so. saying you you will continue to recommend it <laughs> yeah i'm waiting for her to respond actually because she said that she was going to watch the finale soon for season four and she still hasn't gotten a chance to do it i'm just like i need to talk with you about this well you can talk with us right the next episode yeah. very shortly i would recommend i zombie i agree with jen s i think it would be a limited recommendation it's not for everybody mm -hmm. people would have to either like zombie fiction that they can laugh at they would have to like comic book adaptations which is another piece of it they also actually the humor of this show occasionally reminds me of arrested development because it's inappropriate no incest but it's inappropriate <laughs> And it's very fast-paced, and it's very meta-referential. And that's what Arrested Development's whole thing is. So if you're off-put by Arrested Development, you're probably going to be somewhat off-put by iZombie. If you think <laughs> Arrested Development is brilliant, like I do, you're going to think I it's watch that so, show. Oh, I have to think about whether I should recommend it or not. <laughs> it's a cult favorite, what can I say? And we're going to cover it on the podcast, as I indicated in the introduction. I would ask them if they're going to keep watching, but the answer is already yes, because they're going to be talking about season four. So I guess at this time, what I would ask you all, is there anything else you want to say about seasons one, two, or three of I, Zombie? It's good. Yeah, it's good. Watch it. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> what I'm going to do now is thank Kristen, Jen S, and Jen K for joining us for our inaugural podcast episode about I, Zombie. We will, of course, return very shortly. But before we return very shortly, I have to do the thing that I do, which goes like this. CPU is produced by Back Pocket Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Couch Potato, and hails from Grand Rapids, Michigan, please. If you like what you hear, take the time to rate us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or Google Play. Give us stars, comments, reviews. Let us know how we're doing, what you like, what you don't, what we should keep, what we should toss. How about iZombie? You think we're doing well? Tell us. We like to hear. If you have suggestions on shows, you might consider contact us at our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, via email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, or via Facebook and Twitter, though we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time. We have several more new episodes coming down the pike. If you miss old episodes or want to know in general what we cover, we're everywhere. Find us. We tap the Google searches. We are awesomely Couch Potatoes Uniting. You can subscribe at our website, our channels, and our social media to stay up on new events and episodes. Until next time, all available seasons of iZombie are or should shortly be available to stream on Netflix, who should reward loyal viewers like us for our patronage and constant mention of their name. They haven't yet. We just keep hoping. In the meantime, our iZombie panel will next reconvene very shortly, like I said, to talk season four and part two of our two-part catch-up miniseries. So, until next time, until next episode, new episodes published every Wednesday. Keep listening. Keep watching. Stay tuned. Bye. 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 Bye.
bye bye. <laughs> I don't think they've done that yet. No. Nope. Oh yeah, you guys are supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs>